Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, glad to be here. My name is Art Mannion. I work at the CERT Coordination Center, uh, and I'm here to talk about supply chains, particularly uh, vulnerabilities and how they uh, flow down and affect uh, supply chains. So at the CERT Coordination Center, I do a lot of coordinated vulnerability disclosure. Um, we specifically focus on multi-party or multi-vendor issues. Um, these issues underneath are entirely supply chain problems, or more specifically, uh, uh, problems because of lack of knowledge about supply chains. Who and what are affected by a vulnerability? Um, in 2002, significant manual effort and a best guess. In 2021, also significant manual effort and a best guess. We have not improved the state of the practice here in, in 20 years or perhaps longer. Um, these numbers for these vulnerabilities, 285 vendors, 183 vendors, again, manual effort, best guesses, uh, historical anecdotal collections of who uses what software, um, who we could reach via email or by pinging people or doing open source research. Uh, again, awful situation, best guess is what we have as a state of the art today. Um, Bad Alloc is a more recent one, just a small example here. Uh, we've got the, uh, the calloc function in uh, BlackBerry QNX vulnerable. So a bunch of BlackBerry QNX uh, product lines are vulnerable. Um, that in turn hits who knows how many uh, embedded operating, embedded sort of system or IoT, or in this case, ICS, OT suppliers. And EPA and the water ISAC put out a particular warning about uh, the QNX issues. QNX is just one of the 18 vendors uh, lit up by the bad alloc vulnerabilities. Um, there have to be thousands of affected vendors and systems, possibly tens of thousands for bad alloc. And the answer is we don't really know who they all are. So um, the hope here is that software bill of materials can actually really help us. Um, software bill of materials is exactly what it sounds like. It's a bill of materials for software. Um, so one or more identified software components, um, you identify them with names and hashes and version numbers, things you already identify software with. Their relationships, that's key, otherwise we have no chain in the supply chain. Uh, and other associated information you would need to do things like improve vulnerability management or improve, in my case, coordinated disclosure. Um, if, if the SBOM phrase is giving anyone any, any kind of heartburn or trouble, um, Upstream dependency tracking is a fine way to think of it. Third-party inventory is a fine way to think of it. That's all it really is. Um, so very simple, comp very simple concept. Um, but it's more than just your third-party dependencies. Um, you are someone else's third party. So please uh, label and enter into the SBOM your first-party created software as well. In theory, if we all do this, the graph and the network work and we start to gain transparency. Um, this work, I've been involved for almost three years now, uh, comes out of the multi-stakeholder community NTIA process. Uh, just to be clear, that is, dis that is distinct from the executive order uh, requirement for NTIA to produce a report, which they also did. So um, my work and my discussion here today comes from the NTIA community side uh, of that work. And that's the short URL for, for the collection of documents coming out of that effort. Um, two sort of sub, you know, sub, sub use cases for SBOM. One is before public disclosure, whom do I notify about a vulnerability who might be affected? Uh, the second is post, typically post public disclosure. Um, if I'm a deployer or a system administrator, do I have to patch, do I have to do something? And that's the vulnerability management use case. In the end, we want the same information, right? what software it contains these components and what software is affected by these vulnerabilities. As we're gonna see, those are potentially different things. Um, slight nuance on what happens before public disclosure and what happens after. Um, there's a idea, and we'll explore this a bit, that uh, an upstream vulnerability is inheritable down through the supply chain. Uh, and also uh, an idea that Increased SBOM data and inventory data will reveal what's actually already there. Lots and lots of upstream components we didn't realize were there. And their associated vulnerabilities 
So we've now created more of a vulnerability management problem than we already had. We haven't created a bigger one. We just have more awareness of what's already there. Um, how do we handle that at scale? Um, individual human written and human read advisories probably are not going to cut it. So um, I typically view SBOM as a graph. It's a dependency graph. Um, it's pretty, pretty straightforward if, you've, if you're dealing with software dependencies at all. Uh, this is a toy example that comes again from the NTIA work. Uh, and the, the sort of high level of abstraction dependent uh, relationship is simply included in. Um, very likely more nuance is necessary there. You will see in the upper left, uh, bingo buffer is meant to be source code that is compiled, modified perhaps, and compiled to produce Acme buffer. So the Acme version of bingo buffer. Um, and that's gonna be key that, um, you know, built from or derived from is different than simply included. Uh, and then not that it's all that important, but at the far right with Frank's final good that sort of pointing back to itself primary relationship just sort of indicates that Frank's final goods SBOM is talking about the main subject of Frank's final good. Um, Frank's final good could be considered a product here uh, if that's a distinction that helps. Um, although product is somewhat relative anywhere in this chain, uh, one person's product is someone else's sort of component. Now, what happens when a vulnerability is identified in bingo buffer? So the bingo buffer developer, supplier, vendor, maintainer, confirms the problem, produces a fix. There's no argument, it's a true vulnerability. Problem is solved, great. There's no question that that CVE affects bingo buffer. But what does this mean through the supply chain from bingo buffer down into its use, ultimately in Frank's final good? Um, I was hoping early on that perhaps some degree of inheritance could be assumed, and there was a safe way to do that, uh, you know, safe, sort of in a conceptual uh, uh, belief uh, sort of sense. Uh, it turns out that probably instead, uh, every node needs to investigate its own, own vulnerability status. Um, early on from the NTIA work, there was a presentation from uh, Vericode and their study of at least uh, here Ruby, Ruby, Java and Python um, produced a very low uh, inheritance rate, so 5% lower than 5% um, of upstream component vulnerabilities made it down to the Frank's final good level or the product level. Um, so this is real data. I have no reason to doubt it. That's an important uh, bit of evidence. Um, I'm not entirely sure what other ecosystems look like. If this is sort of something you could apply anywhere or if it's less common um, in, in C or something like that. Um, also, even if there's a 5% chance of, uh, of inheriting the vulnerability, do you want to make that assumption? Um, maybe you do, maybe you don't. 5% chance of a truly expensive, horrible impact might simply be too high. So uh, from the NTIA SBOM community work comes VEX. Um, VEX is essentially a way to record and convey vulnerability status. So if you imagine the, the nodes earlier, each one of them would have a VEX, could have, could have a VEX statement about that CVE. Um, one of the tricks to VEX is this first sentence here, copied from the, the VEX one pager, reduce efforts spent investigating non-vulnerability, non-exploitable vulnerabilities. So. Uh, it's one thing to certainly to convey that something is vulnerable. It's actually also very valuable to convey, if it's true, that it's not vulnerable and save us all the time digging into a non-vulnerable problem. problem. Um, affected, not affected, straightforward, action required to remediate. Um, fixed and under investigation are perhaps a different or two different dimensions here, but they are all treated, all treated as status for VEX. Um, you can read more about VEX. There's a one pager at the bottom of the, of the slide here. Uh, also, there's a CSAF profile for VEX. Uh, CSAF is a, uh, a structured advisory, uh, security advisory format. Um, VEX was developed with the SBOM work. However, it's designed to be used without SBOM. You don't need an SBOM uh, tied to the VEX. You can simply issue a VEX statement about um, any software whatsoever, as long as you can identify it in a uh, CSAF compliant way. So despite some evidence here that inheritance is not something to assume, 
I'm not done trying to figure out if it, if it can be assumed in some cases. My suspicion is that non-vulnerability, certain kinds of non-vulnerability might be inheritable. So VEX does not currently uh, support this feature, but it, under discussion during development of VEX, um, there was the idea that uh, I would have a status of not vulnerable and then a reason for being not vulnerable. So for this example, uh, if Acme uh, grabs bingo buffer source code, compiles out or pound defines out certain functions or certain parts of the code, builds their version of it, their own component Acme buffer that they are now responsible for, which finds its way into their application, which finds its way into Frank's final good. If Acme investigates their use of bingo buffer and can um, very clearly um, find and state that the Acme buffer variant of bingo buffer is not vulnerable because the code is not present. The vulnerable code is compiled out. Um, I would argue that, that that reason for being not vulnerable is transitive and the Acme application and Frank's final good can cross that vulnerability off their list. The code is not present, at least not from the Acme buffer component and you can move on and deal with the next CVE uh, in your list. So uh, that's the end of the slides. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, and I'll turn it over to our moderator. Thank you.